Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's the first time I've done anything like this, so bear with me if I'm rubbish. Uh, but I'm James. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer with Mux, um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about uh, living room device uh, app development and the nightmare that it may be. Um, so let's set the scene first. Uh, streaming boxes, let's start with them. Um, I'm sure most of you are fairly familiar with these. Uh, Apple TV, Fire TV, Roku, and uh, Chromecast. Uh, for the, these ones, I think, are actually the good guys. Okay, They're, they're not too bad. Um, the development tools are fairly well understood. They're closed ecosystems. Uh, you know, if you've got a problem with Apple TV, you can go and talk to Apple, say, hey, this isn't working on tvOS. Can I get it sorted out, etc." Similar story for the others. Um, so they're the good guys. Then we move on to the connected TVs. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> the fun. Yeah, absolutely. Who booed? <laughs> I love it. Um, so yeah, so I've only listed sort of the main four for the UK here, uh, which is Samsung, LG, Sony, and Panasonic. Uh, again, each of those have got their own tools. Uh, Tizen Studio for Samsung. Has anyone actually managed to get that to work on a Mac properly? Just out of interest, kind of, kind of. I need to talk to you after this then. I can only get it to work on Windows. <laughs> um, LG WebOS, I actually don't mind LG WebOS. Uh, various other people in Mux might disagree with me. I don't know about you guys. Um, there's Sony. Um, Sony is kind of a weird one. Uh, I put HTML and JavaScript for Sony, but actually they have Android TV in some of their devices as well. Um, but you'll see why I stuck to HTML in a minute. Uh, and Panasonic too. So they're kind of, I, they're in the middle connected TVs. They're not awful, but they're not brilliant either. Then we move on to the set-top boxes. Yay, they're the best. <laughs> Except there's thousands of them, and nobody really knows what's actually going on inside those. Um, so, I mean, how, how do you cater for set-top boxes? It, it's really difficult. Um, you know, if you tried to do something specific for every different manufacturer, you'd, be, you'd, you'd spend your life and probably just want to give up on life by the end of it, because who knows? <laughs> so, uh, my, my experience with uh, connected TVs is through HPB TV. Um, has anyone heard of HPB TV? Oh, cool, we've got a few people in the This is good. This is good. I, I feel your pain, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so what is HPB TV? For those that don't know, uh, HPB TV is Hybrid Broadband Broadcast Television. Uh, it's an organization that's set up to basically try uh, and uh, supply uh, applications through uh, connected TVs and set-top boxes uh, in a kind of more harmonious way rather than this horrible fragmentation that we've got going on across the devices at the moment. Um, it's a mixture of standards, um, or shall I say wish lists, because the standards are very interestingly imp implemented across the different manufacturers. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a browser uh, in, in the device uh, with a few extra bits to take care of TV-specific operations. Um, so what do you actually need to get your app going on HPB TV? Uh, this thing here, is, well, somebody, anyone want to tell me? Anyone recognize it? It is XML, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well done. <laughs> uh, anyone heard of an AIT? Application Information Table. No. Okay, this is the first thing you need to get your HPB TV app to launch. Um, this is just the one I stole from the HPB TV spec. Um, it is just an XML, essentially, uh, but it's the path into launching your web page or your application. Um, I pointed out a couple of important things in there. Uh, the first one is this service-bound Boolean. True, false. Um, that one's quite important for if you're launching from a, a DTT channel or, or a satellite channel, or if you're just launching straight off the back of like an app store or something in, in the device itself. Um, you want to make sure you set that correctly, um, and I'll explain why again a little bit later. Um, there's some version information, that's the second arrow. Um, uh, that's supposed to be controlling which uh, devices or which specification the HPB TV device is uh, and where the app will actually run. Um, so if you've got a, a HPB TV device that's, I don't know, 1.2.1 uh, and it gets an AIT which says it's, this app's only suitable for 1.3.1 and above, in theory, it shouldn't try and run the app. Nine times out of ten, it will try anyway and then you're just into a whole world of pain. Um, and the final thing at the bottom is just the launch URL. Um, so basically, you know, it could be a path to uh, a website, or it could actually be a path to uh, a DSM CC carousel. Uh, those things that do still exist, you know, when you're channeling, just tuning your TV and you get the data channels, one of them, as well. 
Uh, the next thing, once you've done that, is you want to set up your actual kind of web page. A um, couple of things to note. Number one, always make sure you design your app to be 1280 by 720, um, and then let the terminal do the rest uh, if it needs to scale it up or scale it down. Uh, and then you need to include uh, these things which come from the OIPF specification. And this is basically so you can take control um, of your application uh, and do things actually within the receiving device that a normal web page wouldn't be able to do. So that's kind of getting you set up and getting your HPV TV app to launch. Um, let's go into kind of the basics of an app now. So first thing you normally see when you load an app is the loading spinner. Um, you wouldn't believe how difficult these actually are to get right in HPV TV and to get them to spin on every device. <laughs> Sounds so stupid, but it's true. So first off, uh, anyone know Font Awesome? Uh, yeah, everyone knows. Uh, I thought, oh, cool, Font Awesome. That seems pretty decent. Everyone uses it on you know a lot of websites. Let me try that. What a disaster that was. <laughs> Didn't work at all. Uh, SVGs, not a good idea. Trying to load a big library like Font Awesome, terrible idea. So I thought, okay, I'll try doing my own CSS instead with a CSS animate. Also a disaster. It turns out most of these HPV TV devices cannot render animations very well. Um, some of the higher end devices will do, uh, do it quite nicely, uh, but the vast majority don't do a brilliant job. Um, so I was like, okay, brilliant. What, what do I do next then to get my spinner to actually spin? Animate a GIF, yeah! <laughs> Woohoo! Everyone loves an animated GIF. Except, guess what? These cause problems too. <laughs> If you've got an animated GIF with more than about five frames in it, you can guarantee your device is going to instantly slow down by running out of CPU to process that GIF. <laughs> so the answer, just stick some loading text in the middle of the screen and be done with it. Um, it's ridiculous. So, so that's the spinner. Let's get on to the next thing, displaying images. Most UIs have images in them. Um, this is actually difficult as well, believe it or not. Um, there's one very popular TV manufacturer, specifically in the UK, um, that doesn't seem to like images that have any of this stuff wrong. Um, and this is literally a screen grab that I took um, when I tried to load a particular image just on top of DTT, uh, where it just said, no, I'm not going to do that. But I quite happily got a different TV next to it with the exact same code. Image was there, looked fine, looked great. Did it on a few set-top boxes, that was there. Yeah. One nightmare. So you've got to make sure um, you know you set things up properly. Um, mime types are correct. Um, ancillary data seems to be the real cause of the issue uh, we found. Uh, if you've got things like comments in there and stuff like that, this particular uh, device manufacturer, who I won't name because I don't want to get shot later by them, um, they just don't like it. So watch out for that one. Then we go on to video playback. Yay, what we're all here for, video. Uh, HPB TV doesn't actually make it massively clear how to play back video. There's kind of two options in the spec. You can use the object-based player um, or the video-based player. Object-based player comes from the OIPF spec. Video player comes from HTML5 video tag. Um, each has pros and cons. Um, the stuff I tried was with the object player as that hooks in kind of more closely with the decoder actually in the device. Um, video will normally run on the device CPU, which as we've already established is rather limited. So let's try some HLS playback first. Um, nine times out of 10, if you've got VOD HLS, simple VOD HLS playlist, um, it will work. Uh, if you try live, however, that gets a little bit more interesting. There's one particular uh, brand of set-top box. Uh, it was the very first Freeview Play set-top box in the UK, uh, if you can work it out from that, um, where if you've got a playlist that contains events as the type, so a live stream, um, it simply won't play it. I will tell you why. Um, so that's wonderful. Uh, the other problem in there as well, and this is true of VOD and uh, live, if you've got a discontinuity set, it will play as far as the discontinuity tag and then stop, and that's it. So you're a bit stuffed if you've got a live stream and something happens and then it comes back again and you've got discontinuities in there, that device just simply will not carry on playing. All right, let's try Dash instead. Let's see if that's any better. Um, generally, it's not. Generally, it was actually worse. <laughs> uh, this is for HPV TV 131 devices, I should say, so they're a few years old now. 
uh, but it is the majority of the device population, particularly in the UK market, which is where I was working. A um, couple of things with the dash. Uh, again, if this type changes to dynamic, you can guarantee you're going to knock out probably about 70% of the devices. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, Multi-period as well, as you know, might notice here, we've got two periods in this dash uh, manifest. Uh, similar story to HLS with the discontinuity tag. It'll play the first period, no problem. As soon as the second one comes along, that's it. Don't know what to do with that. Um, so that's a bit of a nightmare as well. Um, so once you do eventually crack getting playback sorted out um, on these devices, you might want to uh, interrogate the, the player and know uh, how that's performing. You know, if it's buffering, stuff like that, report this back to a QoE system. Um, here's what's supposed to happen with the object player. So you start in a stop state. Uh, nothing's running. You load up uh, your content and say, I want to play. It's going to connect. It's probably going to buffer. Uh, and then you're going to reach playing. Brilliant. That all makes sense so far. Get to the end of the content getting ended. Perfect. Um, the play state, by the way, the numbers, uh, this all comes from the ORPF specification. It just returns numbers, and then you have to know what the numbers mean. So let's introduce an error into our stream now and see how well we get on with this. So we start off with stopped again, connecting, buffering, going to playing. Introduce an error so that all of my segments in my stream start to 404. What should happen is we get a connecting again. Oh, I'm going to try and connect to get those things, and then eventually we get an error message, if we're lucky. There's a number of error messages that the object player can give. Uh, here they are all listed. The reason number two, unidentified error, is in red is because that's the only error I've actually ever seen be used <laughs> out of that player. <laughs> so great job there. And you're lucky to even get that. Sometimes you just get undefined. And you're like, cool, good. Nice to know errors are working. Then there's one particular device that is out there on the market, has been since, I think, 2017. And we tried this scenario on this particular device, stopped, connecting, uh, buffering, playing, so everything's up and running. We introduced the error into the stream. Playback freezes for 60 seconds, still playing according to the play state we know. And then after about 60 seconds, we just get ended. Cool, nothing went wrong with that stream at all, apparently. Not great. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge is basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say. But HPV TV is not all bad. And actually, it's, quite, it's getting more and more adoption across Europe now uh, and in the UK. A lot of Freeview Play is based off of um, HPV TV standards. Um, so this is RTVE uh, in Spain. This is their catch-up service, which is a great example. Um, BT did a proof of concept last year with a second screen device, companion device uh, as well, using HPV TV. Uh, there's the green restart button, uh, which the BBC have done, and actually, uh, with a chapter in the back seat, Mr. Stuart Webb over there, uh, has recently launched a service for STV with Archiva, um, doing uh, green button restart as well, using HPV TV. Um, so if you want some tips on HPV TV, go and ask Stuart. Um, I could also say Stuart had long hair when I met him, and now doesn't. I wonder why. Um, and there's more on the HPV TV website, so, so go and check that. Um, so, to sum up, uh, this is quite a quick talk, as you've gathered. I don't want to hold you up from the pub. Um, <laughs> to sum up, yes, Connect TVs uh, and set-top boxes can really behave quite badly. So be prepared for that if you're going to get into this world. Try and keep it simple. Avoid heavy JavaScript frameworks. Um, keep an eye on your animations. Don't go crazy with those. And a clean UI often makes for a better experience. Um, if you are launching from the broadcast side, <laughs> make sure you take control of the tuner and switch it off first before you try and shove something else into the decoder because it tends to be that if you're trying to decode two things on one decoder, the device isn't gonna like that very much. Um, turn it into a toaster, which is nice. Um, test everything, make sure you test. Uh, keep a zoo of the notorious devices. Uh, between me and Stuart, uh, when we were working together on this, uh, we built up a rather large collection of pretty terrible set-top boxes. Um, and video playback isn't guaranteed, as I talked about. Um, so make sure you're ready to tweak those manifests and get into the nitty-gritty of uh, what's going on in there. Um, <laughs> monitor from the client side. Use QOE tools. Uh, they're actually the best way to find problems with these rogue devices. Like I said, there's 
thousands of set-top boxes out there. You're never going to be able to test them all uh, with particular ease. Um, so use QRE tools, collect analytics, you know, look for the problems that way and try and work backwards. So why the reasons to cry? Welcome to 2020. What are the manufacturers going to bring out this year? Who knows, but it's going to be a challenge uh, and something that we look forward to working on. Thank you.